Welcome to the History News Network podcast. I'm your host, Andrew, and today we're covering the reaction in the nation's capital to the 1968 assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let's get started. Dr. Martin Luther King has been shot and wounded, possibly critically wounded, in Memphis, Tennessee this evening. Police describe a young, well-dressed, medium-built white male driving a white Mustang, shot at and wounded, possibly critically wounded, Dr. Martin Luther King at his motel room in the downtown area of Memphis this evening. Washington resident Yvonne Baskerville was driving home when a radio news bulletin announced Dr. King was shot outside of his hotel in Memphis, Tennessee. I thought I was going to have a stroke, she recalled. I mean, I was just devastated. You didn't know that he was dead. You prayed that he wasn't dead. But you just knew everything that he'd worked so hard for. Everything he had planned and prayed for was just gone. Once home, she sat in the car to collect herself before she went inside to be with her children and great-grandfather. Born in 1872, the elderly African-American considered King a saint and was devastated by his assassination. Baskerville said he really just lost it. He was so pained that this could happen in America, that someone could really kill him, you know? Not an accident, not lightning or anything unusual, that someone could plan, and plot, and kill. Such a man of peace was just unbelievable. So that night, we didn't sleep. We couldn't sleep. Quickly, news that King had been shot rippled across D.C. Some Washingtonians were eating at Ben's Chili Bowl, a restaurant on U Street, when they learned King was shot outside his hotel in Memphis. According to Virginia Ali, who owned and operated the restaurant with her husband Ben, the patrons anxiously wondered, what's happening? Just a block and a half away at the intersection of 14th and U Streets Northwest, large crowds started to form on the sidewalks after radios and television programs broke the news at 7.30. Good evening. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, 39 years old and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, and the leader of the nonviolent civil rights movement in the United States was assassinated in Memphis tonight. A sniper's bullet cut down Dr. King as he stood on a hotel balcony in Memphis. Within an hour, Dr. King was dead. That happened at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. At 8.20 p.m., a radio news bulletin announced Dr. King was dead. At the Washington Hilton, Vice President Hubert Humphrey broke the news to the D.C. politicos gathered at a Democratic Party fundraiser. King's assassination stunned the participants and plunged them into a mood of immediate, gloomy concern. Not everyone, however, was saddened. One lobbyist in attendance smiled and remarked, Of course, I'm from the South, and I'm glad. A congressman grumbled that he saw no reason to adjourn the dinner just because of this. All speeches and President Lyndon B. Johnson's appearance were canceled, and the filet mignon dinner was barely consumed. Only a mile away, at Ben's Chili Bowl, Religious music played over the radio as people in tears came into the restaurant. People are talking about it, recalled Virginia Ali. This was a gentleman. This was a man that didn't believe in violence. And look how violently he dies. WOL, a popular soul music radio station, played organ music as DJ Bob Terry pleaded, This is no time to hate. Hate won't get you anywhere. And let me tell you something too, white man. Tomorrow, before you get back in that car and go out to the suburban house, you better say something nice to that black man on the job beside you. You'd better stop hating too. Many people's initial shock evolved into bitterness and rage. To many black Americans, King was a figure who embodied their hope for freedom and equal rights. His assassination ended that hope and further exposed the ugly reality that many Americans opposed that dream. Washingtonian Betty Mae Brooks Cole said, The kids just couldn't understand that. The kids just got mad, 
and they reacted not just in Washington, but across the country. King's method of peaceful resistance did not seem to have worked. In this moment of hopelessness and anger, many blamed King's death on white people in general. African-American Washington Post reporter William Raspberry wrote that the violence started with the outrage that a white man killed King. And in the, a matter of hours, the victim had become, in the eyes of too many of us, all black people. And the murderer was no longer one stupid, hate-filled white man. Not even bigoted white Southerners. It was that generic whitey. According to Raspberry, some felt that Whitey had shown his true colors. Whitey had killed the one man who had given black people hope that nonviolence could work. That Whitey had killed the man who merited the title Negro leader, if anybody ever deserved that overused term. That Whitey had declared war on black people. Some in Washington felt that war was coming for them. Two developments in 1968 had made D.C. the focal point of national racial tensions. First, activist and black power advocate Stokely Carmichael had moved to D.C. in early 1968 and formed the Black United Front as a coalition of moderate and militant black Washingtonians. Carmichael was the former national chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, known as SNCC and his name was nearly synonymous with black power and radicalism. Although Carmichael promised unity and progress, many were skeptical he could deliver. Also in 1968, King announced the Poor People's March, set for late April 1968. A multiracial coalition of thousands of poor people would camp on the National Mall to demand Congress pass anti-poverty legislation. Congress, the national media, the FBI, and locals fretted that the increased demand for change would lead to riots. The FBI worried the arrival of Carmichael and King could spark urban unrest. In a report assessing the likelihood of riots in D.C., the FBI argued, Washington is now two-thirds Negro and has a higher percentage of Negroes than any other major city in the United States. Its recent racial record has been comparatively peaceful but danger signals have arisen as a result of Stokely Carmichael's present efforts to create a black united front in Washington, and Martin Luther King's plans for a massive civil disobedience demonstration in the nation's capital this spring. Were it not for Carmichael and King, Washington could probably look forward to another year of comparative racial peace. But Carmichael's current organizing activity and King's scheduled demonstration bode ill for this city. Nevertheless, the FBI concluded D.C. was less volatile than other cities because D.C. had a responsible middle class who would prevent riots and its Negro ghettos are spread out and interspersed with pleasant neighborhoods. Recent reforms, including the appointment of Walter Washington as mayor, evoked a generally favorable response among the Negro population, giving ghetto residents hope for a more satisfying future. Journalists and D.C. leaders also speculated if 1968 would be another long, hot summer. However, some believed that D.C. citizens were too apathetic to ever riot. The Wall Street Journal threatened the possibility of all-out war and argued D.C. had all the ingredients for a racial riot, including dilapidated housing, segregated neighborhoods, high unemployment among young African Americans, poverty, bad police community relations, and poor schools. Nevertheless, the journal concluded Washingtonians were unlikely to riot, agreeing with the assessment of many local black leaders. Activist Julius Hobson thought riots were unlikely because nobody has moved Washington. You could take a little black girl, dress her in organdy, take her downtown, pour gas over her, burn her, and it wouldn't move this community. Walter Fauntroy also thought uprising unlikely because of his own difficulties in getting people to attend a March for Welfare in 1965. Reverend Channing Phillips believed disorders would not occur because the federal government was too big of a target. These leaders and the FBI were wrong. 
Less than a month after the publication of the FBI report, violence erupted across DC's neighborhoods. By 8.30, just 10 minutes after the crowd at 14th and U learned of King's death, officers requested another police wagon to control the crowd throwing bottles. At the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or SCLC office overlooking the intersection, Reverend Arnold Davis called Fauntroy, head of the local chapter of the SCLC and vice chairman of the city council, to inform him of the angry crowd gathering below. Fauntroy agreed to try to calm them. Other leaders immediately felt the need to urge peace. At about 9 o'clock, President Johnson addressed the nation over the radio, saying, I ask every citizen to reject the blind violence that has struck Dr. King, who lived by nonviolence. We can achieve nothing by lawlessness and divisiveness among the American people. Only by joining together and only by working together can we continue to move toward equality and fulfillment for all of our people. Around the same time of the address, Carmichael left his office near 14th Street to ask stores to close. They took our leader, so out of respect, we're going to ask all these stores to close down until Martin Luther King is laid to rest, he declared. If Kennedy had been killed, they'd have done it. As Carmichael went from shop to shop, a pack followed him and shooed customers out of the stores. Most shopkeepers closed without any issue. Walter Fauntroy met Carmichael at 14th and Wallach Place, a block south of U Street, at 915. While the two men differed ideologically, they had interacted for months as members of the Black United Front. Grabbing Carmichael's arms, Fauntroy pleaded, This is not the way to do it, Stokely. Let's not get anyone hurt. Let's cool it. All they were doing, Carmichael assured Fauntroy, was asking stores to close, and Fauntroy left convinced this was a useful channeling of the frustration. Carmichael resumed his mission, and the crowd following the militant grew larger, at one point stretching almost a full block behind him. Street corners all along 14th Street were increasingly crowded as people grappled with their shock and anger. As Carmichael traversed the streets, he subdued some calls for violence. As someone yelled that they would kill whites, Carmichael turned around and asked, Are you ready to kill? How are you going to win? They got guns, tanks, what do you got? If you don't have your gun, go home. We're not ready. Let's wait until tomorrow. Cool it. When a woman broke a window at the Belmont TV and appliance store, SNCC workers blocked people from taking television sets. Carmichael grabbed two children trying to get past, took a gun out of his waistband, and shouted, If you mean business, you should have a gun. You're not ready for the thing. Go home. After hearing what sounded like gunshots, although it was actually glass breaking, Carmichael wrestled a firearm from a man and demanded people go home. None of this. We're not ready. You won't get a leader like this. You'll just get shot. Go home. In an interview the following day, Carmichael insisted he did not mind people breaking windows, but he thought it wasn't safe to be on the street without guns because black people would be shot in confrontations with the police. There's one last comment about these news things about last night. We will tell you where we were last night. Last night, we led all of those youngsters up and down the streets to close every store in this area because Dr. King was shot, and they should have closed those stores. Now, some of them kicked glass store window in. We're not stopping them from kicking in the store windows. We're stopping them from coming out on the streets without guns. When they come out on the streets, we want them with guns. If they don't have guns, we're not going to let them throw bricks and bottles of guns. But when they get guns, we'll be on the streets. His followers did not heed his advice. SNCC workers could no longer block people from entering stores, and youths with television sets, electrical appliances, clothing, shoes, and other items began streaming past Carmichael at 14th and U. Realizing the situation was out of his control, Carmichael got into a Ford Mustang and left the area at 10.40. After Carmichael left, reporter Lillian Wiggins saw whiskey in large quantities being lifted from the store through the broken plate glass windows. Televisions were being carried from a TV repair place 
and clothing was being stripped from the windows. Mannequins were scattered from one end of the street to the other. One man approached Wiggins and remarked, They shouldn't have done this. Killing Dr. King was the worst thing the white people could have done. Local and federal government leaders immediately prepared for civil unrest in Washington after they learned King was shot. President Lyndon Johnson, Mayor Walter Washington, and officials at the CIA, FBI, 116th Army Division, and the Army Command Center at the Pentagon were all briefed on developments in Memphis and the reaction in D.C. and across the country. Military leaders traveled from their homes to the Army Operations Center at the Pentagon to prepare for the possibility of sending troops into Washington. The mayor's office, police department, and civil defense unit established immediate contact to closely monitor the mood of the city. Public Safety Director Patrick Murphy left his home to go to 14th Street less than 10 minutes after he heard the news from Memphis. Plainclothes police officers went to 14th and U as early as 845 to gather intel. Some officers were even in the group following Carmichael. The police believed a visible presence only risked public outrage, so they stayed on the fringes and instead placed police units on alert and activated intelligence sources. This strategy was understandable considering the tensions between the black community and police in DC, and the police's recent success with de-escalating situations by reducing visible police presence. Walter Fauntroy thought the presence of uniformed officers would provoke the crowd and discourage a robust police presence in a conversation with a police officer that night. As of 10 o'clock, there were virtually no uniformed police officers around 14th and U. Once people started breaking into businesses, however, the police quickly increased their presence until it was unsafe and impractical to stay. At 10.10, an officer reported the first incident of property damage over police radios and requested more police. Uniformed officers moved to confront the crowds but were heavily outnumbered. Police radioed that citizens were throwing stones at them and Murphy ordered the police to pull back while reinforcements were summoned and equipped. Officers cordoned off the area and began making arrests or by 11.15. A rain shower and the increased presence of law enforcement cleared the streets, and at 11.28, police reported that there was no rioting in Northwest Washington. They were too optimistic. The downpour was short-lived, and the streets quickly refilled as crowds moved up the 14th Street Hill north to the Central Shopping District. Enforce the law vigorously for any violation and make arrests, Deputy Chief Piles instructed police over the radio. The fire department, led by Chief Henry Galata, mobilized its entire squad as it implemented Plan F at 11.51 p.m. At 12.30 a.m., the first large fire started at 14th and Fairmont Streets. As firefighters arrived to extinguish the flames, people taunted them and threw stones and other projectiles. Police launched 100 baseball-sized canisters of tear gas to disperse the crowd and allow the firefighters to work. This was the first large-scale use of tear gas during the disturbances, but would be far from the last. In total, 150 stores were damaged, 7 buildings burned, and nearly 200 people were arrested Thursday night. 14th Street was not fully quiet until about 4 a.m. Around midnight, Murphy and Police Chief Layton determined that police could sufficiently quell the outbreak and did not require outside help. At 3 a.m., Murphy met with officials from the Army Operations Center at the Pentagon. The men chose to not call up federal troops because the police had successfully contained the disturbance and they believed further disorders were unlikely during the day. The D.C. National Guard was ordered to assemble in uniform at the D.C. Armory for potential deployment Friday night. The Pentagon instructed the 3rd Infantry at Fort Myer to be ready to head into Washington. With preparations made and the city calm, Mayor Washington toured the city's streets before finally arriving home at 4.30 a.m. 
No amount of preparation, however, could prepare them for what happened the next day.